this Thursday afternoon, March 28th, here in South Korea. Contenders seeking seats at the 22nd National Assembly are officially launching their campaigns today, and their rallies will lead up to the April 10th general election. Meanwhile, a fresh joint sanctions endeavor by Seoul and Washington blacklists two institutions and four individuals linked to illicit funding of Pyongyang's hostile weapons. And here in Seoul, bus drivers are on strike following a breakdown in talks over wage hikes and bearing the brunt of these consequences are commuters in the capital city. We start on the local political front. Contenders seeking seats at the 22nd National Assembly have officially launched their campaigns. Now, these public events start today and lead up to the April 10th general election. Ruling People Power Party interim leader Han dong began his rally in the wee hours of this Thursday by greeting people at a traditional market in southeastern Seoul amid government efforts to ease the cost of living. Meanwhile, a main opposition Democratic Party leader Lee Jae Myung kicked off his rally in Incheon by greeting morning commuters before heading to Seoul's Yongsan district, his party's official campaign launch venue. During this formal campaigning period, candidates can use public address systems to reach out to voters and to pass out their name cards. On the security front, a joint, a fresh joint sanctions endeavor by Seoul and Washington has blacklisted two institutions and four individuals linked to illicit funding of Pyongyang's hostile weapons ambitions. Our foreign affairs correspondent Peunji has details. South Korea and the U.S. have newly added two entities and four individuals to their sanctions list for their involvement in illicit financing and generating revenue through overseas North Korean information technology workers that are used to fund the regime's nuclear and missile development. This includes a UAE-based firm called Pioneer Bencon Star Real Estate and a Russia-based company called Alice LLC. South Korea's foreign ministry explained Thursday that the two companies were sanctioned for engaging in the dispatch and operations of North Korean IT workers abroad. Also on the sanctions list are four bank representatives, Yu Bu, Han Terman, Jung Sung Ho and Oh In Jun, for evading sanctions and funding North Korea's nuclear missile development through illegal financial activities such as money laundering. The foreign ministry said Yu Boong in particular is a person that South Korea and the U.S. have both been tracking. The U.S. State Department also described Yu as a linchpin in North Korea's illicit financial activities and a person that's skilled at employing various schemes to avoid detection. The latest action aligns with the 6th South Korea-U.S. Working Group meeting to counter North Korean cyber threats, a two-day meeting that began Wednesday in Washington, D.C. Seoul's foreign ministry said the sanctions are expected to raise awareness of the risks related to transactions involving these individuals and entities, not just domestically, but also within the international community. A recent report by a panel of experts at the United Nations shows North Korea has obtained about half of its total foreign currency income through financial theft, such as hacking and cyber attacks. And these funds were used to cover 40 percent of the resources needed for developing weapons of mass destruction. Peunz, Arirang News. The South Korean Army and U.S. Marines have been conducting drills from March 19th at the Korea Combat Training Center to bolster combined operation capabilities. The U.S. 3rd Marine Division is taking part in the 10-day training for the first time. The drill involves some 230 combat assets, including armored fighting vehicles and self-propelled artillery. The 3rd Marine Division is stationed in Okinawa, Japan, and is one of the first U.S. military forces that can be deployed to the Korean Peninsula in the event of an emergency. Also on the security front, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba has requested South Korea's Patriot missile defense system. He stressed that the system is defensive in nature and not destructive, as it serves to shoot down incoming missiles. The remarks came in response to Seoul's resolute stance against the supply of lethal weapons to Ukraine amid its fight against Russian invasion. 
pointing to North Korea's supply of lethal weapons to Russia, the minister claimed it would be in South Korea's best strategic interest to assist Ukraine. He also emphasized that South Korea may have succumbed to North Korea's aggression if its allies had chosen to abide by its logic of non-lethal weapon support back in the 1950s. In other news, Washington's top diplomat to Canberra was here in Seoul to present President Yoon seok yeol with a special award commending his courage to chart a fresh course of communication with neighboring Tokyo. Our senior correspondent also uncovers this occasion and more. President Yoon seok yeol has received an award he won last year from the John F. Kennedy Foundation for his courage and determination to pursue better bilateral ties with Japan for peace and prosperity for the region and the world. On Wednesday, you met with Caroline Kennedy, the Foundation's honorary president and the current U.S. ambassador to Australia, who had requested to deliver the award herself. She is the only surviving child of the former U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Yun had won the International Profile and Courage Award last year with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida for working to improve bilateral ties despite domestic opposition arising from historical issues. In particular, the foundation had noted Yoon's efforts towards rapprochement with Japan shortly after assuming office. It added that such courage to choose a more hopeful future led to a historic level of trilateral cooperation between the US and two of its most important democratic allies at their Camp David summit last August. Ambassador Kennedy said it was an honor to personally present the trophy to Yoon, noting he had pushed for the good of his people, nation and the world despite political opposition. Her husband, designer Edwin Schlossberg, who accompanied her to Seoul, had designed the trophy, modelling it on the shape of a lantern used on the USS Constitution warship to signify sincerity and courage amid external pressure. Yun said he was deeply moved to receive an award from former President Kennedy's family, pledging further efforts towards peace in the Indo-Pacific based on trilateral cooperation with the US and Japan. He noted the honor symbolizes the former U.S. leader's new frontier spirit, which envisioned a better future during hard times through social and economic reforms. A senior official at Yoon's office told Arirang News that it is through the same courage and a sense of mission based on the new frontier spirit that the president has tackled illegal labor union activities, promoted education reform, and steadily pushes for medical reform despite the political disadvantages that may come his way. Previous recipients of the Courage Award include Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, U.S. Presidents Barack Obama and George W. Bush, and former U.N. Secretary General Kofi Annan. Young, Arirang News. Bus drivers here in Seoul are on strike following a breakdown in talks of wage hikes and bearing the brunt of these consequences are commuters in the capital city. Our Lee Sing Jae reports. The Seoul Bus Labor Union and representatives from management began last-minute negotiation talks on Wednesday at around 3 p.m. That meeting lasted for 11 hours before the labor union called for an end to the discussions in the early hours of Thursday morning. By 4 a.m., the union declared that its drivers would go on a strike, marking the first strike by Seoul's intracity bus drivers in 12 years. However, there is still hope that the two sides can agree to end the general strike as soon as possible. Despite the breakdown in negotiations, working-level talks are still ongoing, and attention is now being paid to how much the gap will be narrowed during this process and whether an agreement can be reached. The key issue behind the talks is a wage increase. The 18,000-member union has reportedly asked for a 12.7% increase in their hourly wage, a revision of their salary system, and the abolition of wage discrimination for contract workers. The union is arguing that the increase in wages will also prevent manpower outflow to the Incheon and Gyeonggi regions. However, the management side has stressed that such an increase is excessive compared to the inflation and wage increase rates over the past five years. The Regional Labor Relations Commission, which has been mediating the negotiations, proposed a 6.1 percent increase, but ultimately failed to reach arbitration. With the general strike by the union, 7,210 buses, or 97.6 percent of all Seoul City buses, are now out of service. The last time drivers went on strike was in 2012. 
However, at the time, the partial strike only lasted for 20 minutes, avoiding any inconvenience to commuters. With this strike expected to last longer, Seoul City began operating emergency transportation measures to minimize inconvenience to commuters by extending and increasing subway services. To quickly connect subway commutes, free shuttle buses are also operating in Seoul's 25 autonomous districts. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the government has renewed calls for trainee doctors to return to their respective hospitals, reaffirming its pledge to enhance working conditions for all junior doctors at medical centres. Our Che Soo-young has the latest. The South Korean government once again urged trainee doctors to return to their hospitals by the end of March. The government said interns won't be able to start their new training in the hospitals unless they finish their new employment registration by next Tuesday. To all trainee doctors, please return to the training hospital until March. For those who have been accepted as interns this year, you are required to register by April 2nd. If you fail to register by this deadline, you will not be able to undergo internship training for the first half of this year. The government has also stated that it will promptly improve in the working conditions for trainee doctors. Firstly, it plans to shorten the working hours of trainee doctors enacting medical laws to limit maximum shift length to 36 hours starting on a trial basis from May. The government will provide additional training expenses of 1 million Korean won, almost 900 US dollars to trainee doctors in essential medical sectors like obstetrics and emergency medicine. The number of cooperating hospitals for cancer patients will be expanded from the existing 100 to 150. Currently, President Yoon suk has proposed discussions with the medical community on the health care budget and health care reforms. The government has been presenting numerous alternative measures over the past few days. However, the medical community's response has been firm. Im hyun a pediatrician elected as the new leader of the Korean Medical Association, insists on completely nullifying the government's plan to increase medical school admissions by 2,000 places. Moreover, professors from so-called Big Five medical schools in Seoul, including Seoul National University, Yonsei University, Ulsan University, Catholic University and Songgyungwan University, have all agreed to submit resignation letters. Among the trainee doctors who began resigning six weeks ago, none have returned yet, and over 10,000 medical students have applied for leave. To minimize disruption to patient care, the government says it will deploy an additional 1,900 physician assistant nurses and 200 more public health doctors. Che Hyung, Arirang News. On the business front, Hyundai Motor and LG have unveiled ambitious initiatives to bolster Korea's industrial ecosystem via greater R&D investment and larger corporate manpower. Our Park Kono covers their plans. South Korean conglomerates LG and Hyundai Motor Group are set to invest domestically in advanced industries to raise their competitiveness. According to LG during its annual shareholders meeting in Seoul on Wednesday, it'll be investing 100 trillion won, or over 74 billion US dollars, within Korea for the five years until 2028. That's around 65% of the company's global investment total. LG said around 50 trillion won will be invested in future technologies, including AI and bio, along with pivotal business fields such as batteries and next-generation displays. The company aims to make Korea a manufacturing hub of research and development and smart factories. As there is a high possibility of AI being a game-changer in our society, it is a good idea for companies to invest in important fields such as AI, bio and secondary batteries. On the same day, Hyundai also announced its mid-term plans for investment and employment in advanced industries. The company said it will be investing 68 trillion won, or roughly $50.4 billion, for three years including this year, with each year's investment volume at around 22 trillion won. That is a 30% increase compared to 2023. And most of the investment will be allocated to R&D, including technologies for software-defined vehicle and building new electric vehicle plants along with research infrastructure. 
Hyundai plans to diversify its EV lineup to up to 31 models and expand its annual car production to over 1.5 million units by 2030. Hyundai will also be hiring around 80,000 people, and more than half of that number will be workers in advanced industries. One expert predicts a bright future for companies investing in these fields. If Korean companies could develop technologies and products through R&D, there'll be more investment from overseas. He added that building partnerships between these companies and the government will also be important to the development of future industries. Park Geun-hye, Arirang News. Also here in Seoul, an exhibition is currently underway showcasing the prospects of using robots to automate low-skill and physically challenging manual labor to free up highly skilled human workers. Our An Song Jin was there. Robots are now being looked at to lead automation in the manufacturing industry. Smart Factory and Automation World 2024, hosted by the Ministries of Trade and SMEs, kicked off on Wednesday showcasing various robots from more than 400 companies with nearly 70,000 people participating. The solution to a lack of manpower is a digital transformation and applying technology like AI can boost productivity and increase safety in the workplace. Hanhua Robotics, which first launched collaborative robots in 2017, develops robots that are used in multiple industries, including those of automobiles and electronics. These robots perform not only simple tasks such as picking up and placing heavy objects, but are also capable of screwing things in, polishing, and welding. They have a similar reach to a human being and can help when a workspace is narrow. As the working population is shrinking, these robots can fill gaps in the unstable employment market. Workers also get to do more productive tasks rather than tedious jobs. We're looking to create a total robot solution. Similarly, this company, Rainbow Robotics, also provides solutions for automation with a specialization in humanoid robots. The company provides manufacturing collaborative robots such as robotic arms to boost productivity. Its two-armed robot is being introduced for the first time at this exhibition. At 120 to 170 centimeters tall and weighing around 50 kilograms, they can perform the exact same tasks a human can with five fingers on each hand that can bend and pick things up. With artificial intelligence, they can also easily perform input tasks. We're now looking to focus more on autonomous mobile robots that can assist workers in the retail sector, including humanoid robots. The possibility for automation is near infinite, and it's important to have an internalized platform like ours. The global automation market is expected to grow up to nearly 400 billion US dollars by 2029 from 200 billion dollars in 2022. With continuous government support, the sales of domestically built industrial robots are expected to grow up to 3.1 trillion won or 2.3 billion US dollars by the end of this year. An Song Jin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. We begin today in Indonesia, where two losing presidential candidates have demanded a revote, alleging fraud at the polls and general irregularities. Indonesia's top court began hearing the appeals of the two candidates, Anis Baswedan and Ganjar Pranowo, on Wednesday. The results of the February 14th election announced on March 20th indicated that Defence Minister Prabowo Subianto won with 58.6 per cent of the votes. Former Jakarta Governor Anis Baswedan and former Central Java Governor Ganjar Pranowo trailed Subianto with 24.9 per cent and 16.5 per cent of votes respectively. Baswedan and Pranowo both claim irregularities and are critical of Subianto's running mate, 37-year-old Rakabuming Raka, the son of the outgoing president, Joko Widodo. The country's top court, at the time led by Widodo's brother-in-law, made an exception for Raka to run despite the minimum age requirement for candidates being 40. Pranowo is demanding that election results be annulled and the winners disqualified, saying that a firm stand must be taken to reject oppression including the government's use of state resources and the security forces to support certain candidates. 
Thailand's lower house of parliament passed a marriage equality bill on Wednesday, moving a step closer to legalizing same-sex unions. If approved through all legal procedures, Thailand will become the third territory in Asia to legally protect equal marriage rights. The bill had full support in parliament, with 400 votes for and 10 against from the 415 members. Some lawmakers displayed the LGBT flag during the session and many applauded as the flag was waved after the bill was confirmed to have passed. Initially, one of the 400 parliamentarians accidentally pressed the wrong button, showing 399 in favour, but the error was amended accordingly. Thailand's marriage equality bill now must acquire the Senate's approval and the King's endorsement before it becomes law. A bus crash on a motorway in eastern Germany, close to Leipzig, has killed at least five people and injured around 50. The bus, operated by Flixbus, was on the busy A9 motorway connecting Berlin to Munich before it swerved to the right and ending up on its side. Leipzig police spokesperson Olaf Hopp said at the site of the crash that while five people were killed, that number is not yet verified. Flixbus also commented that the exact circumstances of the accident are not yet known. While the police said the figures were only based on the number of seat bookings, some 53 passengers and two drivers were on the bus traveling from Berlin to the Swiss city of Zurich. Now to Russia, where two polar bear cubs have taken their first steps outside in the snow at an eastern Siberian zoo. According to a staff member at the Orto Doidu Zoo, the cubs were born in December 2023, but the mother of the cubs did not allow them to venture outside until they became strong enough. The cubs are born blind and weak, weighing only around 500 grams. The mother bear, named Kolimana, was found orphaned in 2012 at a natural reserve in Yakutia's far northeastern Arctic Ocean coast. The father, named Lomonosov, was born at the Leningrad Zoo in St. Petersburg and later moved to Siberia. The zoo's name, Orthodoidu, means Middle World in Yakutia Sakha language. According to local myth, the Middle World is where animals and humans thrive, while the Upper World is inhabited by the gods. Kim ji Arirang News. Good afternoon. After some very pleasant weather we had yesterday, it's a rainy day again. Central regions could receive rain mixed with yellow dust, while mountainous regions on Jeju could see up to 80 millimeters, while parts of Gyeongsangdo province could see 30 to 80 millimeters of heavy spring rain, along with thunderstorms and strong wind. We had a warmer start to the day, but rain is dragging down the highs 1 to 5 degrees, lower than Wednesday. Day, topping out at 14 degrees in the capital, just at 13 degrees in Daegu. And the changeable weather we've had this month made for an unpredictable cherry blossom season. Colder than normal seasonal temperatures and the lack of sunshine due to frequent rain are behind the delay. Cherry blossom festivals kicked off across Korea, but it will take extra days for the full bloom to be seen. But at least the weather conditions will become more promising from tomorrow for the flowering. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. That ends our Thursday afternoon newscast. Coming up next is our daily panel session. Thank you for now.
invite internationally active opinion leaders and experts from various fields to the studio for an in-depth talk. From arts and culture to sports and social sciences, they share their stories and experiences, giving insights into the visions and directions of each field. Bringing the latest trends, K-Now. Introducing people receiving the spotlight, K-People. Sharing recipes for every occasion, K-Food. Reviews of the latest movies and theatrical performances, K-Movie and K-Stage. 10 minutes of Korean culture every day. From ambitious performances by rising stars to the return of idol groups. K-pop bands introduce their own albums and perform the title tracks. With mesmerizing performances, the audience's roaring support and viewers' real-time participation. Simply K-pop Contour is a must for all fans of K-pop. Watch live performances by indie artists who don't frequently appear on TV. Plus, get to know them better through the special emoji talk only on Playlist Up. This is your chance to discover talented musicians and diverse K-pop tunes beyond mainstream music. Tune in to Playlist Up at 11 a.m. every day. Lotte takes a new leap beyond its boundaries. Our change will lead to better lives for all. New Lotte, the power of a better world. New today, better tomorrow. Lotte. Welcome. Welcome.
on Issues and Insiders today, we touch upon the latest Korean work of literature that is garnering rare reviews from critics in the US. Hello and welcome to Issues and Insiders. It's Thursday here in Korea and I'm Min Sun Hee. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with the author and the translator of a critically acclaimed Korean novel in the US. I have Park So Young, the author of Snow Globe, here in the studio. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me. Thank I you. also have Chung Min Lee Comfort, uh, the translator of the novel Snow Globe. Chung Min, it's great to have you with us online. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Right, so we'll start here in the studio then. Let's begin with a synopsis perhaps of your novel. What is the uh, story about? Yes, um, so it's a dystopian young adult novel about the journey of finding true value of ourselves with unique settings. So Snow Globe demonstrates a new ice age caused by the climate change that we are going through right now. So the most people live in the frozen wasteland, while only a few live in the soul warm city looking like a giant snow globe. So in exchange of the warm and wealthy lifestyle of Snow Globe, the residents' lives are broadcast to the open world for the people outside as an entertainment like the Truman Show or Keeping Up with the Kardashians. So what's happening in this world is a twisted version of Cinderella. So an ordinary girl, Cho Bam, of the open world who works at a power plant. She is asked to be a stand-in for the most loved celebrity from the most watched show overnight because the celebrity killed herself. So that's how she steps into snow globe, but she slowly gets close to the dark and dangerous secrets of the glass slippers she's in. So while, while readers follow the breathtaking story, they'll be asked that, would you give up your privacy for a wealthy life? And would you give up yourself to be someone special? So the journey of Cho Baum will let readers have the moment to think about these matters. Right, I see. And speaking about journey, Chung Min, walk us through your initial encounter with So Young's novel and how did you come across it? What led you, your decision that is mm. to translate it? Sure. Um, so my amazing agent uh, contacted me one day and asked me to check out this quite fantastic young adult sci-fi for a potential sample work. And uh, I was a tad bit skeptical because I had never done or even um, read a Korean young adult before, but um, I had done a few sci-fis and enjoyed it um, tremendously. So um, I agreed to give it a go. And when I finally got to reading it a couple of weeks later, I, I just couldn't put it down. It was such a page turner. The setting, the characters, the plot and the twists and all the twists, really, I, I was blown away. And um, the funny thing is, um, despite my initial hang ups about the young adult label, I almost instantly um, started hearing the narrative voice in English. And I'm sure a lot of translators would agree that getting the voice down is half the battle. So this coupled with Soyoung's um, amazing, like masterful storytelling and um, fluid writing style, I, I, I couldn't get, I, I couldn't wait to get, get to work. Right, and, and Soyoung, what was the inspiration behind mm -hmm. your story, The Snow Globe? Yeah, so Snow Globe was inspired by new media trend such as vlogs and social media because nowadays someone's life on online has become the most like frequent and important entertainment we use enjoy on a daily basis. So it got me curious, what if we keep going in this direction nonstop? So I imagine a future where we can um, like the most important thing for survivor is watching others' lives and being part of content oneself. Because we are already living in the world where you know fame has become the most significant element of everything, and privacy has already become the new currency. You share your experiences, your life, and yourself, then in return you get dollars. So I believe that when readers read Snow Globe, they would feel the world they are following in the book is not that far from where we are. 
And I, I believe I asked you this question before we met here in the studio. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to draft up the first version mm -hmm. of this story? So it took me like only four months to write the first draft. So I'm quite a quick writer, but it wasn't the full whole process. Of course, there were many at like revising and it more process after that. But it took me not that long time because I don't know, the world was already there inside my head, I guess. And all you had to do was put it down on paper. Yes. <laughs> Jungmin, Snow Globe has been garnering quite uh, a number of rave reviews there in the US. What do you believe is the appeal to the American audience? Well, um, it's, a, it's a great story <laughs> and a timely story that reflects multiple hot topics that occupy the minds of a lot of people across the globe these days, um, regardless, of their, regardless of their culture or language. And um, it's a highly engaging and entertaining one at that. So from page one, it drops us into this fascinating universe of, of um, post-apocalyptic Earth where new and extreme physical environment has reshaped our existence. But um, humanity will still be humanity, right? And the rich and the powerful have once again managed to rig a system that justify their rule over the suffering masses. So there's the eternal issue of class struggle and there's also reality TV, celebrity worship and just young people struggling with their identity and discovering who they are and what they are made of when thrown into extreme and challenging situations. So there's that, but um, there's also the obvious fact that it's an authentic Korean novel um, originally written for the Korean audience by um, a Korean writer a, a, and a massively talented one at that, I should add. Um, and this fact alone might be um, a great point of attraction for, for many Americans because, um, to be frank, the Korean brand is so hot right now. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a great time to be a Korean. And I'm just so thrilled and grateful for all the attention that it's been, it's been garnering. Right, indeed. Uh, so as Chongwe mentioned, your book, it touches upon a host of issues, some of which mm -hmm. you mentioned a bit earlier as well. Now, from climate change, mm -hmm. you touch upon social, social inequality mm -hmm. as well. Simply speaking, what message are you seeking to share with your audience through your story? Yes, so the climate change was the essential background of the world I created, and I could not demonstrate the world without mentioning social inequality. But, and yet, what I wanted to share with my readers was personal identity, because I have been fascinated by personal identity my whole life, and I believe that protecting one's identity has become more important than ever, because we are living in the world where we can compare ourselves to million people every minute just by scrolling on a smartphone. So it's getting harder and harder to shape and build our identity in our own way. So that's why I wanted to write a story telling us that the most important identity in the whole world is each one of us. And Snow Globe is all about that. Because when Chobam is asked to be a stand-in for the most loved celebrity, she doesn't hesitate to be that person, to be someone special, someone else, because she just accepts the deal because she wanted to be someone special. So that's how she becomes the princess of the world, but she faces the inconvenient truth that what she abandoned is the most precious of all, which is her own self. So. I hope that readers can have moments where they can embrace themselves once again the way they are and discover how special and valuable they already are throughout the journey of Chobam. And speaking about Chobam, to what extent, uh, sorry, do you suppose does Chobam mm -hmm. hold qualities that reflect you perhaps? Well, That's you a know, question, I understand. No, it's like sometimes people ask me, like, who's your favorite character in the book? And I cannot say it's Chobam because she's just so much like me, you know? So if I say, oh, my favorite character is Chobam, it's like, oh, I love me. <laughs> 
<laughs> my favorite character is myself. It's just like that. So she reflects a lot of aspects of myself, but she still, she is so much braver than I am. So that's how she could make some changes in that concrete system. So yes, she's way much braver version of myself. That's what I can say. Changmin, we typically, that is, speak about efforts to ensure that nothing is lost in translation. Now, having said that, what are your priorities, Changmin, in translating works of uh, literature? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, my top priority as a literary translator is is always um, to recreate the entire reading experience, um, including the joy of reading the particular book for the English readers who don't read the original. Mm -hmm. So this means I not only transfer the meaning, but any nuance, but, uh, yeah, but also any nuance, um, rhythm, um, clarity or intentional ambiguity and any emotional impact that the author intended to, to deliver with the text as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the Korean and English language pair, this means I have to make a great deal of creative decisions along the way to, to ironically, stay true to the whole of the original, um, as opposed to unduly obsessing over the individual parts, because the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts, right? And um, that's why dialing into the voice in the beginning is critically important, because that's what informs all such creative and inarguably subjective decisions that I have to make um, along the way. But yeah, even with your best effort, sometimes some things are lost in translation, uh, as you said. And uh, that's because you just can't save, save them all, all the time. Um, and so in these instances, I, d I decide what specific aspect of language I, I want to bring out to achieve the particular desired effect at the moment, and that's the best I can do. But I also want to mention that uh, things can be also found in translation, um, meaning you can remind the readers that as much as they relate to the book and relate to the characters, it is rooted in another culture different than their own, and therefore it has something new and different to, to, to tell you. And I think this is one of the great joys of reading a translated book, being exposed to new things, new ways of being, new ways of thinking, new ways of looking at the world. So, um, yeah, I mean, without this aspect of the reading experience, there would hardly be any point of reading a translated book, right? right. I, I like that, the phrase of uh, finding things in translation. And that being said, perhaps among your subjective and creative decisions then, uh, Chongmin, was that uh, the reason why you chose to stick to some of the Korean words like mm -hmm. ajumma and perhaps mm -hmm. the uh, cultural practice of eating myokguk on birthdays mm -hmm. without going into the explanation of why that was mm -hmm. so? Oh, for sure. So, yeah, I'll start with uh, the milk soup. Um, so, obviously, I didn't expect the average American reader to, to be familiar with milk soup um, or with our practice of having it on birthdays. But, yes, I left uh, the correct, um, the Korean word intact without added elaboration because, um, one, there were plenty of contextual clues around it that hinted at what it was and our practice of eating it on birthdays. And two, um, you, you ultimately translate for, for the time um, that, you, that you live in, and we live in the age of the internet. So my thinking was that if an American reader wants to learn more about milk soup, um, a simple Google search can help them uh, scratch that itch. So um, yeah, at the end of the day, it wasn't worth interrupting the flow by inserting something that obviously wasn't there in the original for the Korean readers. Um, with ajumma, um, it's a little bit more complicated. I had originally done away with it, done away with it altogether um, upon unsuccessfully fiddling with anti, mem, and a couple of other options that just fit like a square peg in a round hole. And the decision to resurrect it by taking it across in Romanized Korean came later, um, after I had already submitted the translation to the editor. And uh, yeah, so it was one day when I was idly thinking about the, the manuscript and um, and the decisions I made that the scruples I had about having left out Ajumma began to grow because um, Ajumma, I mean, 
for those those in the know, it's such a loaded term, and you don't want to throw it around lightly, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I'm technically on Ajumma, but uh, who wants to be called that, right? <laughs> and in the book, um, the main character uses it to to address another character, um, another female character, with a specific intent to show her disdain for for that character. But then, as their relationship evolves, um, the 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 way the title is used also begins to evolve. And it ends up signifying the trust and closeness between the two initial adversaries. So it's the more I thought about it, uh, the more it its role, uh, the yeah, um, became meatier. <laughs> and um, so I was already swaying towards bringing back the title into the text and words borrowed from other cultures and even made up terms. Uh, which readers are not familiar with uh, initially, but uh, would go on to embrace, and that made me think: why, why couldn't Snow Globe do that for Ajuma? You mm -hmm. know, or all the Korean Ajumas, past and present, who are in fact the unsung heroes uh, mm -hmm. or sheroes, I guess, heroines <laughs> of um, the country's stunning economic and social progress. Well, as an avid read reader of that book as well, I have to say, as an Ajuma myself, I I'm grateful you left the word as it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm moving forward, Soyoung. Broadly speaking, as uh, Chongmin mentioned, it's a great time to be a Korean with mm -hmm. K-pop, mm -hmm. K-music, K-dramas. Mm -hmm. uh, broadly speaking, how do you explain the growing uh, interest mm -hmm. across the globe mm -hmm. in uh, Korean uh, literature in recent years? Well, there are monumental books such as Please Look After Mom, The Vegetarian, and Cursed Bunny that have captured the attention of global readers to Korean literature. However, I cannot talk about Korean wave without mentioning that significant contrib contributions of other Korean content like Parasite and Squid Game. Well, because Snow Globe has been compared to them frequently ever since around the time its publication. And what surprised me the most during the recent American book tour of Snow Globe was that American readers, American people like Jung Min's husband, they have been enjoying Korean dramas so much. So Squid Game was just one of them. And they said, the K-drama storytelling style is very similar to some of their American novels. That's how they found K-dramas amusing. And I believe that throughout this kind of experience of getting familiar with Korean movies and Korean series, I think they are very much ready to dive into various Korean novels. You know, that's how Snow Globe could be in the New York Times bestseller list right after it's published. I believe that people around the world, are they have now learned that made in Korea fictional stories are very good. That's why I strongly believe that it's time for Korean literature to be a part of global people's cultural life. And so what are your thoughts about Snow Globe, your story mm -hmm. moving from paper mm -hmm. to the screen? Well, it's I, w I feel so privileged because, you know, I cannot wait for the day that I can see the world that I created on the screen. You know, it's such a dreams come true moment, one of my biggest dreams come true moment. And I believe that people would be so much amused by the like moving characters and all the unique scenes, especially for the part plant, because it's gonna be so like sweaty and gloomy. But right after that scene, people would see a wonderland of snow globe. So there would be so much, so many stuff to enjoy from the movies or series. The juxtaposition would be amazing, of course. Yes. Chongmin, pundits believe translation looks to play a crucial role, of course, in boosting the presence of Korean literature on the global stage. What are your thoughts? I can only agree with the pundits. <laughs> and uh, echo as well um, has just said, I think she, yeah, she said it brilliantly.
Xiaomin, if there was more that could be done to bolster the trade of translation where the Korean language is concerned, what would you say? Um, so, yeah, as to how to bolster the trade where the Korean language is concerned, um, well, first of all, let me let me express my um, deep gratitude for the Korean government's powerful boost over the past couple of decades mm -hmm. that really helped put Korean literature and other content out onto the international stage, and I hope that will continue. Um, I also would like to share a comment, I guess, I, I, I received during the book tour that I got to take part in alongside Soyeon. Um, so a reader approached me to specifically tell me how gratifying it was for her to finally see a Korean author translator pair. Mm. And though technically I'm a naturalized US citizen now, um, I understood exactly what she meant. Because um, as a translator who translates into her second language, uh, as opposed to her, her native tongue, um, Actually, English is my third language, but anyway, you can tell by my non-native accent that I'm not a native English speaker. And um, I'm, I'm a minority in the field and frankly, an incredibly lucky one who are given the rare opportunity to prove that it doesn't always have to be a native English speaker from a Western world who has a formal educational background in literature or translation and who began studying the Korean language in an academic setting. And, um, and given that literary translation is uh, such a subjective art to which um, the individual translator inevitably, in, excuse me, inevitably brings a lot of their own world, um, the field can only be enriched with, um, with, with more diversity. For sure, Jungmin, for sure. So let's end with a few words now about your plan for this year. Well, obviously, the most and biggest plan for this year is to keep writing stories. And I have been working on my new book. It's a supernatural sci-fi about a woman who is 660 years old. The reason why she is unrealistically old is because she has been cursed by a supernatural existence to be the last person to die. Therefore, she cannot die until everyone else dies before her. So, but she's not immortal nor invincible. She's just an ordinary person who has to suffer the sorrows of life and the inevitable loneliness of being human and the emptiness of existence for endless amount of time. That's why she wants every single human to die so that she can end her life. And her dreams come true by a space disaster one day. And we follow her journey of dying, where she might have a chance to find the light of her life once again. And also, I will be meeting my readers with the book I published last September. It's called 내가 있는 요일 in Korean title. And, you know, Snow Globe 2, the sequel translated into English, is coming out in the spring of 2025. So I cannot wait to read the translated script by Jungmin. And please wait for more Adventure of Snow Globe. Right, of course. Will Jungmin be translating your next book as well? She's working on it right now. Right, good to know, good to know. All right, so thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today. Mm -hmm. And Jungmin, thank you very much for your comments. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Most welcome. All right, then. Well, on that note, we end this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching.